everyone. Welcome back to the Advanced Thyroid Series. So if you, you're here, which means you've probably been diagnosed with a thyroid problem, maybe Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and we all know too well when, it ha when we have this, these issues with our thyroid, what comes along with it tends to be things like gut problems, maybe skin rashes, fatigue, the brain fog, and being on thyroid medication for many women hasn't cleared those problems up like they hoped that it would. So today we're going to the root, possible root cause of some of those problems, which could be Lyme's disease and other chronic gut infections. With me today is Dr. Jay Davidson, leading expert in Lyme's disease and chronic infections. He's a doctor of chiropractics, number one international best-selling author. He is the host of the Chronic Lyme's Disease Summit, one, number one, two, and three summits. <laughs> he was also the host of the Parasite Summit and the co-host of the Detox Project host of the Detox Lime and Health Podcast as well. So welcome, Dr. Jay Davidson. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, do a deep dive in on helping people's thyroids. Yes, that's awesome. And so I would love, I mean, your story, like everybody else, is like you, you didn't just come into this by accident. It was actually thanks to something that was happening with your wife. You were in a practice of chiropractics and your wife was getting pretty sick and she was diagnosed with Lyme's disease. So can you just tell us kind of why that kind of drove you into doing an entire practice around this? Yeah, um, it was really from you know, pain to purpose from test to testimony. We, I would say before you know, my wife crashed when our daughter was born, and uh, that was almost seven years ago now. Uh, my daughter's almost seven, but there was really no need to do anything else. Very, you know, successful practice, helping a lot of people, changing lives, teaching, you know, a couple radio shows, like it was, it was fun. And then when my daughter was born, um, the bottom fell out. My wife couldn't recover. It was really challenging. This is, it's, it's our one and only child uh, right now. But um, so the whole parenting thing was really new as well, but my wife had crashed. And what's interesting about, because obviously this is about the thyroid, probably one of the leading indicators of that the post-pregnancy, post-labor process was not going to go well, was that her third trimester, she started having some symptoms, some heart palpitations, heart flipping. Of course, went in and, you know, worried not only about my wife, but about the baby inside. And we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl at the time, but um, they ran some tests and came up that she had thyroid issues, came up hypothyroid and autoimmune thyroid, that she had nodules on her thyroid. And it's like, oh my gosh, okay. Well, pretty much uh, you hear some TSH and, or here's some, you know, armor thyroid basically. And um, that's pretty much all they gave us. And my wife even hesitated on taking that, you know, because we're very, uh, at the time, very much against like any intervention and just kind of wanting the body to, do its own thing and, and heal naturally. And then when the labor came, I mean, the bottom fell out, she couldn't recover. So it, it's interesting how the thyroid was one of those things that showed up on analysis, but she like an ultrasound of her thyroid where it's like, oh yeah, there are some issues, but we didn't, yeah. we never dug deep enough. And the reason that we did was because my wife almost died after um, giving birth to my daughter. She oh, wow. just couldn't re recover. She couldn't heal. And at the time, I was like, wow, I think my daughter's a curse. Like, my wife is literally dying right now, and I don't know what, what to do. And then realizing, no, she's the biggest blessing in the world, because then that forced us to dig deep and actually get to the root issues. Because if she hadn't crashed, there would be no reason to dig down and get to the root issues, because she was just getting by. And I feel like so much of the population just gets by until boom, you get your face smashed up against a wall and you're like, wait a minute, what do I need to do? Or like, boom, you get pregnant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or pregnant. Because it happens and, all the time, Jay, where yeah. it happened to me. It was what, that's what triggered mine. But I hear it all the time, which was, I was feeling, I thought, okay, got pregnant and then had, everything just went downhill. Like, it's horrible. Yeah. And my wife had a lot of she had a lot of health issues when she was younger. She was in a coma uh, when she was seven years old. And that's when Lyme disease basically infected her, I believe, too. Bartonella, when I look back, she had brain encephalitis. And, uh, you know, there, that's kind of when her health issues began and just kept moving forward. She had 
uh, a couple heart ablations um, from SVT. She had sinuses, sinus surgery. I mean, all that happened before I even met her in undergraduate uh, college. And then, you know, she had been the guinea pig and things so long that's like, stop. I'm done trying things or testing things out. Like I just want to get by. And that's when obviously if you don't listen to the signs and symptoms, they get louder and louder. And obviously the loud one was when my daughter was born. And so she had, she been diagnosed prior with Lyme's disease to having your daughter or did that come after? Uh, she was diagnosed with Lyme when she was seven years old. Um, so that was in Madison, Wisconsin. And her mom's like, I'm hearing about this thing called Lyme disease. And granted, my wife is almost 37 now. And so that's nearly 30 years ago uh, yeah. at this time. Yeah. She wasn't very prevalent, wasn't very yeah. knowledgeable. The internet wasn't even really there. So, um, and the doctor's like, no, no, no. And then they tested and it did come up positive, which was probably the standard Western blot, which stinks, but somehow it came up positive for her. And then that began her her journey. So when she had some crashes before from mold in my apartment and things like that, and we did enough just to get by and figured out there was heavy metal toxicity, which is a big epidemic, especially for the thyroid and mercury. Um, but kind of kept hitting walls and didn't have enough motivation to push through and figure it out because it was like she was getting by. But then when my daughter was born, that was, that was the straw that broke the camel's back, as they say. Yeah. And then you decided that was it. I'm, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to know everything t there is to know about Lyme's disease and how to fix my wife. Yeah. 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 I'm like, well, let's figure this out, you know? And I, I love it. Love me or hate me. Like I'm a, I'm either all in or all out. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was all in and OCD and researching everything. And we went all over the place. And the thing that I kept coming back to, I mean, everybody in our life was a blessing because it, it led at of least course. to the next step or it gave us like a nugget that we could take. But the thing I kept coming back to was, wait a minute, like I'm learning all this stuff yet. I don't, f I feel more confused now than before. And so it was uh, where I feel like I've been blessed is being able to put things in an order so that as you're listening to, for instance, this thyroid series, or as you're listening to different podcasts or speakers, instead of like, Oh, now I'm gonna have to change my whole protocol. And you know, you push the 30 supplements away off the side. Now you're going to take 50 different ones. You know, instead of doing that, we can actually start learning and be like, oh, that fits right into the drainage part. Oh, that fits right into immune system and chronic infection. All oh, that fits in a detoxification. You can start building your toolbox with actually um, knowledge of where to put it. So it becomes less overwhelming and more, all right, I could do this. That makes sense. And you, and you want to continue learning like with awesome stuff like this. Yes. Um, so for our listeners, I would love it if you would just give us kind of uh, a quick overview of what Lyme's disease even is and why are we seeing this crazy epidemic right now of Lyme's disease? Because I feel like it's everywhere and it gives people these unexplained symptoms. Yeah. So Lyme disease, according to the CDC, it's a tick-borne disease. So a tick um, bites you and technically it's actually sting. It's more like a mosquito, but it's got barbs. So when a tick uh, stings you, it basically punctures your skin. And then if you try to pull the tick out, a lot of times, you know, the head will stay embedded in there because there's the barbs that are, are sticking. So a quick thing, quick uh, million dollar tip, if you ever get bit or stung by a tick is never put anything irritating on it. Alcohol, a flame, essential oils, as amazing as those are, because the tick will actually throw up and you're more likely to get infected by irritating the tick. So really what you want to do is get a very inexpensive tick removal device. You can get them on Amazon for maybe six or eight bucks, a two pack. And it kind of looks like a spork where you scoop between the tick and the skin and all you do is you spin it. And when you spin, the blades fold in and boom, you get the tick out without making it mad. Um, if you don't have a tick removal device, because most people just won't take action and get it as part of their kind of first aid kit because they always wait. And Nor would somebody want to leave a tick. Like uh, that would be so hard to do. Be like, oh, I've got a tick on me. I'm just going to order something from Amazon and wait. No, 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 no. <laughs> so if you don't, then you could get a, tw a tweezers. Just be very careful. But the idea is you actually want to twist the tick, right, to pull it out. So the CDC states that, oh, Lyme disease is only in about 13 states in America, which of course... Lyme doesn't know borders. So it's in Canada, it's in Mexico. Yes, it's, we've it's heard everywhere. that here too. Is that, Oh, there's not that kind of tick here in Canada. Mm. <laughs> I don't so, think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's everywhere. It's in Australia. I mean, and, and the reason is, is birds carry ticks, you know, um, 
Lyme is in mammals and deer and rodents. I mean, it's spread through many, many mechanisms. But the primary thing that they say is a tick bite or a tick sting is how it transmits. The thing to understand about this is, and I know it's a little long-winded, but it definitely has many points. The thing to understand is if you do get bit or stung by a tick, um, it can be transmitted in any time. It doesn't have to be attached for 24 hours. That was research done on ticks on dogs where the tick had to get through long hair to get to the skin. So, you know, for humans, it can trans, you can get Lyme disease way quicker. But remember that viruses, parasites, other forms of bacteria are in ticks besides just Lyme disease. So even if you're like, oh, I'm good. I don't have Lyme disease from a tick. What about all the other stuff? And so what if a tick transmits a virus? What if a tick transmits a parasite and you're like, oh, maybe, it, maybe it's going to be Lyme disease. Give me an antibiotic. What's the antibiotic touch? Only bacteria. So we're missing big pictures if we just focus on Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is a bacteria. It's a spiral keat, a spiral shaped bacteria. So it doesn't like the bloodstream. It loves to drill. It loves to go into joints. It loves to go into organs and tissues, which is typically why most lab testing is insufficient because we're looking at blood usually in traditional labs and Lyme doesn't necessarily like blood. It likes to be kind of hunkered down. So most lab testing is insufficient. It will typically come up negative, and a lot of people have Lyme disease. A lot of people have the bacteria. The key is, is not just the fact that you have the bacteria. The key is, is that your body can't handle it. Your environment, your terrain is horrible. So let's say you give birth to somebody, a child, that's a trauma, physical trauma. Now that's time where that critter that's been embedded in you can actually come out and thrive because your immune system suppressed based on the trauma. These critters, um, you know, Lyme disease, parasites, these things, they like traumatized tissue because the immune system isn't as functional. That's why a lot of times females have reproductive issues after birth is because tissues have been traumatized and now the immune system isn't functioning uh, optimally. So if you're going to get any area in the body where they're going to thrive, they're going to go after the area where the immune system isn't functioning as well. So if you've had surgical procedures in different areas and you're wondering why does it seem like it just keeps nagging me? I mean, there's many pieces to it, but one of them is the immune system and infection. So Lyme disease is an infection. It can cause flu-like type illness, but the vast majority of people that have Lyme disease have chronic Lyme disease. And CDC states 300,000 cases a year in the U.S. alone. And that's with what they qualify. So most people in the Lyme disease world would say that number is probably at least 10 times that, right? So maybe 3 million um, to be accurate. So it is a big infection, but the infection then will attack thyroid. Um, Epstein-Barr will attack thyroid. I mean, there's so many different factors with one bug, let alone usually when you have Lyme disease, there's going to be other things like Bartonella, Babesia, different viruses, these things too. And do you think that it's always from a tick? Is there anything else that could give you Lyme's disease? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Sexual transmission, for sure. So oh. there, there's three different types of spirochetes that are out there. Um, the one other one that's really more known is syphilis. And the reason oh. they say it's a sexually transmitted disease, it's a sexual transmitted spirochete, but syphilis shows up on the skin. So it, when you have syphilis, like it's way more detectable because it's skin surface versus Lyme inside the body. So it's not that far-fetched to say that, well, Lyme could probably be transmitted sexually too. I mean, there was research done in uh, University of Wisconsin where they found that the Lyme spirochete, the Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the species, actually was found in the milk of cows. So it's, and again, this is, we're jumping from um, animals to humans, but again, testing on humans isn't as easy. So is it that hard to think, well, if mom has Lyme disease, that the mom could pass it through the breast milk than if a cow can pass it through the milk? But yeah. we, we also know in research that a lot of miscarriages actually happen because of Lyme disease. So the mom has Lyme disease, tax the fetus, and boom, um, you know, the baby doesn't make it. So babies can get Lyme through mom uh, in womb. I believe they can get it through the milk as well. Uh, sexual uh, intimacy is a, is a big piece as well too. And then just being, I mean, the, the fact that you're in a similar environment, I think will put you at a risk factor because of the environment as well. But my, my take is it definitely spreads more than just through ticks. I, it's my take too. I just feel like in the coming years, we're going to, we're going to 
we're going to know more where it's going to be like, oh, this is actually causing Lyme's disease as well, or some sort of other transmission of it. Because you talk to so many people where they're like, I've never, from my recollection, been bit by a tick, but I have Lyme's disease. And it's like, well, then how did that happen? You know, and there's a lot. Do you find that in your practice where people are like, I had no idea I was bit by a tick? Yeah. Well, my wife, when she was seven years old, never found a tick, never had a bullseye rash. So of course it must not be Lyme, but we know that, you know, 30% of cases will get the bullseye rash. So what about those other 70%? We know that um, in research, I actually wrote my recent book or my second book that I wrote, uh, which is my last one right now, it's called How to Fix Lyme Disease. And in that I kept it short because most people with chronic illness have brain fog and it's like, what did you say? Can you repeat that again? You know, so my wife's like, just keep it short. And she's like, keep it to 80 pages. I think I kept it like to 120, of course, but a little bit longer. But I put in there with all the research, like mosquitoes transmit Lyme, spiders, you know, all this stuff is in the research. These different mammals can carry it as well too. So, um, I mean, theoretically, could you get it just from going out, hunting deer, eating that meat? Potentially, right? Could you get it from drinking raw milk if they found, you know, spirochetes in the milk. I mean, potentially, I think there's many, many ways, but the accepted way is a tick bite. Right. And there's this, because there's a strong correlation between parasites and Lyme, do you, is there any theory there of a parasite being able to carry Lyme's disease into the body? Like if you get blastocystis, it could be carrying Lyme's disease? Well, there's been research. So Dr. Alan McDonald has shown that, so there's different types of parasites, lots of species, which Mm -hmm. is why that testing is not sufficient as well, because there's just not enough knowledge yet. Like two years ago, they looked at 40 different species of parasites that they hadn't looked at before, and they found over a million new genes. And this is just in the last two years. So to think like, oh, my PCR test, I'm looking for DNA fragments. Well, we don't, you know, in 10 years, maybe we'll be so much more advanced. But right now, I mean, there's going to be some limitations. But Dr. Alan McDonald showed, um, he found in MS patients that 100% of the cases when you like, or um, 100% of the cases MS, like he found spirochetes in the brain. Oh. And then he also, he also proved that Lyme disease, the spirochete, lives in can live inside of nematodes which is a type of parasite right and that was one of the big breakthroughs where it was like boom yeah that makes sense like so if i'm gonna go after lyme disease the the quote-unquote natural or the traditional treatment is antibiotics and short term and then if you have a renegade you know md they'll do long-term antibiotics but typically as soon as you stop after a couple years you crash because the goal of the antibiotic is just to kill the bacteria But what if that bacteria is living inside of a parasite and you haven't done anything to address the parasite, as soon as you stop treatment, you're going to crash because that bacteria is just going to come out and play again because it it was in hiding. So this is where if you understand um, kind of the layers and the protocol order, it changes everything. And that goes for the thyroid as well. Amazing. Yes. So when it comes, so people, they get diagnosed with hypothyroidism, like your wife did, here's your armor. We'll see you later. And then things aren't getting better. And so what are we looking for when we're trying to connect? Do I maybe have Lyme's disease and that's what's causing my, my thyroid issue? Well, I would have, so the top four things that I see, not just, to, not just to narrow it into the Lyme space, but the top four things I see with chronically ill people is chronic infection. And that would be, we could throw Lyme in there. We could throw other forms of bacteria we could throw viruses as well too, like Epstein-Barr, CMV, hepatitis, these types of viruses. The second thing I would put on that list is parasites. And you could, I mean, you could say parasites are chronic infection, yeah. but I like to separate it um, just because of the role it plays. And we can talk about that if you want in the yeah. protocol order. So we've got chronic infection, bacteria, virus, we've got parasites, we've got mold in your environment. And that's a big one, suppress the immune system. And oh my gosh, it, it wrecks the, it it wreaks havoc on the thyroid. And then the last thing in the, in the four is toxicity. In the toxin category, heavy metals is a big epidemic, radiation, uh, and then pesticides. Pesticides might be one of the scarier ones actually. Yeah. Glyphosate in the rainwater, that stuff. Yeah, that's everywhere. And how, what exactly is happening then when we get these infections? Why does it affect the thyroid? So there's different things that, um, I mean, your diet, you probably have speakers talk about, you know, gluten can mimic 
thyroid and if you have leaky gut, it sneaks across and the body starts attacking the gluten and it starts thinking your thyroid's gluten and next thing you know, you know, you have autoimmune thyroid. So we know diet plays a role. And so when I say the top four things, uh, I'm kind of laying as a foundation on those four things, diet and then also m mindset slash emotional traumas, the things that have happened in the past and then also what's creating, you know, your present reality now. So I would say that's kind of the foundation. So not to push diet off or not to push like, you know, what happened in the past emotionally or what's going on currently, but really sticking kind of in the functional medicine side of side of things. We've got viruses that have direct links with the thyroid, Epstein-Barr, EBV, it's a type of herpes virus. 95% um, of the population has, you know, tested basically positive for it. But the thing to understand is, then why isn't everybody sick or why isn't every single person have a thyroid? Because it really comes back to our body. It really comes back to the terrain, but it can be a trigger. So if you look at, you know, my wife, having a 25 hour natural labor and you know really long process and then my daughter's there and then my wife couldn't recover like that was a lot of trauma that then allowed these critters if you will the virus and because she was diagnosed with Epstein-Barr before she diagnosed with thyroid issues she was diagnosed with Lyme disease she was diagnosed with heavy metal toxicity but we just couldn't put it together and, and the and, baby sucks everything out of you right so then uh, there goes all your micronutrients that help you de to detoxify <laughs> Yeah, and then and then when you're pregnant too, your immune system bounces from Th1 to Th2, to then after post labor, T, you know, Th1. So it's like you're you're more likely to have autoimmune after pregnancy because your immune system is kind of changing, you know, to support the baby. So, um, but we've got viruses that attack specifically the thyroid, uh, which ABV. We've got Lyme disease that's which is which is a bacteria specifically attacks the thyroid. We've got mercury, which has a really high affinity for that little butterfly organ, you know, on your, on your, on your throat, essentially, um, the food you take in. So there's multiple factors. So if somebody comes to me and like, Hey, I have thyroid issues. It's not that I push the thyroid off, but my mindset is just, what are the sources? What is the source? Because if you still have a thyroid, I believe it can heal. If you've had it removed, well then, you know, technically your ovaries and your bone marrow, and this is obviously if you're female with ovaries, but your bone marrow and ovaries will actually produce a little bit of, you know, T, T4, if you will. But um, I mean, it's not going to be enough to keep up with it, which then is pretty much going to lock you on to either synthetic or bioidentical forever. But if you still have that thyroid organ, now it's getting to the source. It's removing the toxin. Um, it is uh, removing the infection. And when you remove that stuff, then the body stops attacking its own tissue. It stops damaging its own tissue and allows it to really function optimally. And do you, can you give us like case studies a little bit of when you, when somebody might come into you and say, you know, I'm on armor, I'm on whatever type of thyroid medication they're on and what they're presenting with and kind of the protocol that you would go through with somebody. Yeah. So vast majority of people that um, my team sees is primarily autoimmune and vast majority of thyroid cases are going to have autoimmunity. So even if somebody says, well, I don't think my thyroid's a factor, I mean, inevitably, Thyroid almost usually is. Um, typically chronic chronic fatigue, like just energy is gone. You know, you should be able to wake up and like pop out of bed and like, I'm good to go. And if you don't have that energy, then the body's probably not firing all cylinders. Can I, could, could the, can the thyroid look good on a, on a lab test, but the person is still feeling fatigue and can't jump out of bed? And is that a sign or will the lab tests never look good? if they haven't got to that underlying infection? Well, it depends on what you're utilizing as a lab test and also your levels. So in the traditional, you know, which I'm sure many people have talked about this, they just run TSH, which is not even a thyroid hormone. It's a yeah. brain to the thyroid. So if you're gonna check the thyroid, you wanna check the whole panel. That means T4, T3, and the free and the total. And you wanna check obviously TSH. You wanna check the antibodies, TG, TPO. And then you also wanna look at reverse T3, which, you know, I'm sure people have talked about yes. the thyroid panel. So yeah. if you have a complete thyroid panel and you're just looking at pathological levels, which yes. essentially is disease levels like 0.45 to 4.5 for your thyroid TSH. Yeah. You could absolutely be within that limit and still have issues because okay. those are pathological levels. That means that it's like so far past and it's disease state where really when you want to look, you want to look at what we call functional lab levels that if you're within this range, which is a narrow, narrow, narrower range, it's a hard word to say, <laughs> narrow range, 
um, you're less likely, we know that the thyroid is going to be more optimized function, but you want to look at that TSH, T4, T3, because you could have normal TSH and uh, low T4. Well, then you know the thyroid itself isn't working enough. Typically what, I, what we see like clinically is the T4 to T3, the T3 drops down, which is the conversion typically in the liver. I mean, the liver is the lifeline. If there's anything to think about instead of the butterfly, and maybe somebody wants to punch me for saying this, but instead of thinking of the butterfly thyroid organ, it's like focus on the liver. You'll change so many people's thyroids because it's the conversion factor that's usually an issue with individuals, but it's, it's all, it's all individualized, right? It's all Depending. very individual. Yeah. I was just thinking, because so the, the natural protocol, even when you work with a functional medicine practitioner is... Um, it, they, it maybe even they're aware of the fact that they need to get up into the upper third of that reference range in order for most people to feel well. And I'm just kind of asking, um, could somebody be in that upper half of the reference range, but still be feeling like crap? Like, do you ever see that? Do you see someone that's in the upper half of the range? So looking at it from a functional medicine standpoint, it looks good, but they feel like crap and then they have to dig farther and it's because they have the Lyme's disease or some sort of parasitic infection. Typically, no. I mean, if you run a complete thyroid panel, it, there's going to be something off. Now, could things be within even the functional range and still be off? Yes. Because really, and my good friend, Dr. Todd Watts taught me this. He's, he's so knowledgeable on the thyroid. He'd be a great person for this too. But um, he's taught me really looking at TSH to T4 to T3 uh, and reverse T3 that you actually want to look at from a functional standpoint. We can chart this. Is it going up or down between those? And we know then that there's phase issues. So even if it's within the pathological range, even if it's within the functional range, we can still see abnormalities and know that. So even if it's within range, if we actually look at the patterning, typically I don't, I can't think of a case that's ever not had something definitive in that case. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a good thing to point out too, the T3 as well as cortisol will lower. That's a natural thing that will, your body will do when there's infection. And I think we, in functional medicine, people are going straight to, oh, you've got adrenal insufficiency, you're too stressed out, which is super common. However, so many of these people that have hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's, it's, they're, they're, it's not adrenal fatigue. It's their body going, no, you have an infection and we're going to drive this down because the, because they've seen their scientific studies where they've treated people for infection and their cortisol literally goes back up to normal within days of treating that infection. And I think that we miss the boat on that a lot in functional medicine. So you know, it could be that it's a Lyme's disease, it's parasites. So let's get into the whole testing, drainage, detox <laughs> stuff that you want to talk about, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, really the body's, the body's amazing, right? If, it, if you're low in T3, a lot of times it's just shunting it to reverse T3, which is, it is a sign of stress, which could be emotional, but a lot of times it's chronic infection underlying. Mm, yes. Exactly. And we're masking, we're going to give these people this medication and we're masking what's, what the body is naturally supposed to be doing right now. Your body is driving these two things down on purpose. It's trying to preserve your body. And then we're going dumping in all this medication before even checking what, if there's a root cause to it. Yeah. And when you're looking at labs too, you want to think about more patterning than just a one time like, oh, I'm going to check my thyroid and this is what it is. The body's dynamic. It's always changing and adapting and different stressors. I mean, if you if you have some horrific stress, your body, I mean, liver levels, thyroid, everything can really change. And then you think that snapshot at moment, assuming the lab was accurate in their interpretation, is exactly what your thyroid is. So think more long-term that repeat tests and look at patterns than just one test and that's definitive. It's kind of like allergy testing. I mean, your allergies, you know, you run a thousand yes. plus dollar allergy test and two weeks later it could be different. So um, we don't want to take this as it's the gold standard, you know, across the board. So no, yeah. It's just, just that when you do that, it's a snapshot in time and it can change so quickly. So, so let's talk about, let's talk about mapping out the protocol. Cause I yeah. feel like this will be most valuable for your listener of this thyroid series. If you understand the order, all the knowledge fit, you can, you can start plucking it in, in place. So if somebody comes in with thyroid as my wife had thyroid issues, the first thing I'm doing is not treating the thyroid. 
Now, if the thyroid is non-functioning, I mean, bioidenticals, no things, I mean, that's what that's there to help kind of modulate symptoms. But thinking big picture, what can you do to not have to be on thyroid meds forever? What can you do to not have to be taking adrenal support forever? Clearly, there's an underlying issue. So if we figure out what those are, life's going to change for you. So the first thing is identifying what's wrong with you. I mentioned kind of the top four things, chronic infection, parasites, mold, and toxins, heavy metals, pesticides, radiation. If you're not sure what's a factor, and mold's a lot bigger factor than most people recognize, uh, mold in the house, mold in school. If you go to school, mold in the workplace. All of those or any of those can be a factor with suppressing the immune system, which then can allow infection to thrive, which then is gonna, uh, can wreak havoc on the thyroid and can cause hypo, Hashimoto's, hyper, you know, all these different things. You can get the, the thinning of the eyebrows, you can get lethargic, horrible skin issues, your metabolism can slow down, the energy drops, right? All those things. If you can't identify, can't rule things out, just assume it's part of the puzzle. So it almost default of saying it's all an issue versus none of it's an issue. And then if you really rule it out, like, no, I'm really sure through all the different testing and looking at symptoms and exam and all this stuff, like it's not an issue, great, then move on. But the order is after you identify what's going on, the first thing we want to do is uh, support the drainage pathway. Drainage is way different than detox. So detox is, you know, Karen, I'm going to grab onto a toxin in your body and pull it out. I'm detoxifying the body. The body's got natural detox organs, liver and kidneys. However, it gets overwhelmed and then the, if you will, just the bucket of toxins continues to build up and then symptoms uh, continue to pop up. Drainage is just the normal pathways to clear things. So the colon, pooping, going number two, if you're not going at least once a day, that's a drainage pathway clogged up. Now on the health side of it, if you're looking to repair your health and be really optimized health-wise, I would argue two to three times a day you want to be pooping. Not, not, not water, you know, diarrhea type stools, but you want to err on the side of making sure that pathway is open more than less. Because as soon as you start killing pathogens or detoxing chemicals, if that gets clogged up at all, you're going to get symptoms, you're going to react, and then you're going to stop your protocol. So keeping that pathway open, really important. So drainage is the colon moving, the kidneys uh, clearing out, uh, the bile duct and liver, you know, moving moving toxins. Um, that's probably one of my favorite areas to talk about and most, mm-hmm. most detrimental uh, with thyroid cases as well too, if that's blocked up. The lymphatic system, uh, brain draining to the lymph or what they call the glymphatic system, the skin sweating, right? These are all drainage pathways that have to be open. So my wife, this was another warning sign. She didn't sweat. So she didn't even need deodorant. I was like, oh, what a blessing. You don't even need deodorant. And yet, I don't sweat. I, I had that too. <laughs> and, and that was before my daughter ever came along, right? Like she, my, my wife stopped flying an airplane because of anxiety. And she, she traveled to Florida like once a year growing up. Like flying wasn't anything new. We went to seminars and all of a sudden like just the anxiety got so bad. Her thinking about it, she stopped flying two years before my daughter came around. So, I mean, we had all these yeah. signs and signals, but they weren't strong enough to really get us to pivot really until my daughter came along. So, and they seem unrelated. Like mm-hmm. who would think that that would all be under the same umbrella. You're not sweating and you have anxiety. Nobody would think that. Yeah, exactly. So, um, opening up drainage is number one. And all that basically means is make sure you're pooping two to three times a day and then make sure you support the liver bile duct. There's many different things that you can do for it from optimizing your sleep to hydrating, Uh, There's herbs that you can take to help move the bile and things and support the liver. There's herbs you can take to help uh, so you can poop and and go number two easier, especially if you travel and things get thrown off. You want to try to keep that as regular as possible. Um, There's positions. So using a stool like a squatty potty at your your toilet, getting your legs elevated. I mean, just there's so many pieces to this and you could start doing a deep dive in. But if we categorize and understand, okay, drainage is first. Mm-hmm. And if you're saying, mm, Dr. J, I don't really know a lot of drainage tools. Well, then we need to put more focus into to building that toolbox for you. But if you're like, I've maybe I've read Dr. J's books and, you know, because I, I, I love to talk about drainage or I, I've mastered coffee enemas and it's part of my routine. Great. Then maybe you don't need to focus more on drainage. Most, in the, <coughs> most people me. do though. Yeah, yeah, most people do, especially with thyroid. Like if you are sensitive to things, chemically sensitive, food sensitivities, because that's so, so 
unfortunately common now in chronic illness and it's becoming more prevalent. First of all, mold is probably a factor for your health. The other thing is your liver bile duct or your phase three detox. And I hate the fact they say detox, but phase three drainage. So your liver does phase one and phase two detox in the liver. And then after it processes those chemicals, it dumps it into the bile, majority of the toxins. If that bile's backed up, then that toxin byproduct backflow in your blood system and that's when you get real sick and react. So the toxins need to go in the bile. The bile dumping is what they call phase three detox, but it's really how the liver drains. That so often is the... So it holds it everything up. It holds everything up. And if you can just open that up, like everything changes for an individual. Sensitivity. So talking like doing things like, I just did a whole month on liver and gallbladder detoxification. Is it a lot of like bitters, like eating the bitter foods, taking bitters and taking things that, you know, hydrochloric acid and things that help break down the fats in, especially if someone doesn't have a gallbladder, it's, then it's relying on the liver. And so are we taking that kind of support of supplements and, and kind of little hacks that support those? Is that what you mean when you say liver and gallbladder? Bio clean, like bio yes. support? Yes, okay. Yep, yep, bingo, yeah. So it can be the food you eat to like bitter greens and things like that, bitter herbs. It can be the supplements you're taking, coffee enemas, casserole packing, liver gallbladder cleanse. I mean, um, so many things will impact that. Emotions are, are held in every organ. Emotions for, for the liver is really resentment and anger. Um, so there, there's so many pieces to this and it really just depends on what level you're ready for. But but that has to be the foundation. It's like, if anything, that's where you're starting. For, for yeah. anyone that's listening, you got a thyroid problem, don't even question, just start doing some support for your drainage. Yep, yep, and, and here's the classic, I mean, I can't tell you how often I see this. This has gotta be weekly. People post it on Facebook. I started on taking, um, you know, I was cleansing parasites. I started Mimosa Pudica seed and Formula One, and man, I started reacting. The stuff I saw coming out of my stool and then just, I realized this stuff works, but I really realized I should have been supporting drainage first to open the pathways up before, because we all want to jump into let's kill bugs let's or let's cleanse. Yeah. Yeah. Let's <laughs> detox heavy metals. It's like, that's uh, great, no. <laughs> but support the drainage pathways. And then as you move forward, you're less likely to cause symptoms, but there's just certain people, Karen, they need to feel the symptoms to know that it's working. So true, great. Yeah. Like, Hit it hard, get the symptoms, and you're like, oh, wow, this is doing something. Then go back to really following, you know, following the right order and, and the protocol. Yeah, people, it's funny that people just don't want to believe that no. And I always tell my clients <laughs> that if you're going to do a liver cleanse, you should probably support your liver first for a month, or sorry, a parasite cleanse. Support the liver for a month so you get your detoxification pathways up and running. And they're like, nah, just give it to me. <laughs> it's like, no, you're going to feel like garbage. But yep. yeah. <laughs> so um, taking, okay, taking so that, something that. to bind onto the bile, like bioactive carbon biotox is great uh, because the bile gets recycled a lot. So besides things that'll help create movement, you also want to bind onto the bile. And then another thing that I've kind of brought into the functional medicine world a few years ago is TUDCA or TUDCA, T-U-D-C-A. That thing is awesome. Uh, and it stands for Tororso Deoxycholic Acid but that's why we just call it TUDCA or TUDCA, T-U-D-C-A, all capitalized, kind of an acronym. Um, but if you take that, it's a water-soluble bile acid, helps to open up phase three. We've got a product coming out that specifically, uh, we've designed it to support phase two, phase one, two, and three, uh, and actually make it through the stomach acid. A lot of the testing we've done on the stuff out there, like only 20% gets through the stomach acid and the products out there, but it still works. I've seen amazing testimonials from Tudka or Tudka, which is why I've been such a big fan, uh, but kind of on the science side of it, there's there's cool stuff coming down the pipeline, you know, real soon for that. But if you just take something herbally to open it up, uh, implement coffee enemas, uh, take something to bind onto the bile, I mean, you will, your health and life will change so drastically. And of course, there's higher levels that you can go if you need to, but that's the drainage category. A woman that just did my liver gallbladder cleanse in one month lost 18 pounds. And she'd been following a clean diet. It wasn't like she was new to healthy eating. It was just that she started doing the liver gallbladder attention and we had lots of bitter foods in the meal plan. We had um, stuff that they would drink beforehand and they had supplements that were supporting uh, phase one and two um, and 18 pounds in a month. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like you need to keep supporting your liver. Like what a sign 
that there's a, there was a problem in that area. But I do see that almost across the board. If a woman has weight loss resistance, when they support the liver and the gallbladder and their detoxification pathways, it always ends in a, a uptake of weight loss, basically, especially for those that yeah. were stuck. Yeah. Well, so many, so many women are in the estrogen dominance and estrogen dominance actually actually plugs up the bioflow, which then is kind of a negative loop within the body. So having hormones messed up essentially in the body will actually plug up the drainage and plug up the bioflow. Dr. Stephanie Seneff has shown too in research that just glyphosate will stop the production of bile and secretion of bile. So these toxins, hormones, there's multiple things, uh, parasites. There's a lot of parasites that love the liver bile ducts, strongyloides, which also loves the sinuses. Um, We've got liver flukes, giardia, roundworms have been shown in research to climb up into the bile duct and clog it up. So there's many things that can clog it up. And that's why I really want to put a lot of focus in, in movement. Motion is life. Motion is life. Same thing with drainage, exercise, you know, all that. Um, are you a, a believer in the Holga Clark liver, the gallbladder flesh? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great tool. The Epsom yeah. salt, olive oil, grapefruit yeah. juice. <laughs> I've done that yeah, one a number of times. Oh, it's horrible. It is. It is brutal. And those that are adrenal insufficient, meaning that they just they kind of walk, they kind of walk a tightrope, if you will. I don't recommend it for them because that it, it can be quite stressful on your body. I'm a lot bigger fan of coffee enemas, kind of getting the yes. more consistent release. But the liver gallbladder flush, I can't tell you over the years how many patients it's saved from having a gallbladder pulled out. And they're like, hey, doc, I got to get my gallbladder out. I'm like, do the flush. They're like, what if it gets clogged? I'm like, they're going to take it out anyways. You're just going to get out a little sooner. And in and, and all the cases, nobody's ever that I've ever heard of got a clogged gallbladder duct from a flush. But, yeah. it, but it's saved. I, I don't know. I remember my doctor telling me there was no way that I, I – pooped out gallstones. I'm like, well, no, there was no, <laughs> no if, ands, or buts that those were gallstones. Like they're bright green stones that come out. Like there's, there's <laughs> it was definitely, it works. And I've done it a number of times, but yes, I think that that's good advice that if you have some adrenal insufficiency, that maybe it's not for you until that that's strong. Cause it is really harsh. Like it makes you feel sick, but the coffee enemas, you're really big into coffee enemas. Mm -hmm. um, people, I, it's one of those things that I don't talk about, but I've, I've done, I think my first coffee enema would have been probably 20 years ago. And back then nobody was doing them, but I was like, I had this book, it was called the uh, prescription for nutritional healing. Do you remember that one? Mm -mm. Book came out yeah over 20 years ago and it was like my bible it was one of the first like nutrition books that i'd ever seen and probably one of the few that were even out there on the market at that time and they talked a bunch about enemas and of course coffee and a lot of people don't know this but coffee enemas help you to drain the liver yes Yep. So an enema, drinking coffee orally is different than when you absorb it rectally. Uh, you want the tube in about six inches. It goes right to the liver, bypasses pretty much everything, goes right to the liver and stimulates bile production, stimulates the bile to be released. We'll also stimulate glutathione to be protective. Uh, there's some things that we can add to the solution to essentially energize it and trigger phase one and, and optimize kind of phase two and three as well too. But the basic thing is just look for organic air roasted coffee, uh, get a coffee enema bucket kit and just do it. I mean, it can be uncomfortable. Like I'm going to stick a tube where, oh, but yeah. it is not fun. You're, once you're you like, Oh my God, if somebody opened my bathroom door right now, God forbid. <laughs> but once you do it, I mean, I cannot tell you how many people are like, I don't know if I could ever live without these now because <laughs> you feel so much better because it's really focusing on that phase three and yeah. opening that up. So it, if you're not ready for it, you're not ready for it, but just put it on the list as it goes in the drainage category. And when you're ready to be like, all right, I'm going to try this coffee enema thing that Karen and Dr. J are talking about. <laughs> Great. Now it's time to do it. And uh, Dr. J has a tutorial on his, which I'm going to link to um, on an actual site called, what was it again? Co something coffee? Yeah, ultimatecoffeeenema.com. Oh, yeah. And he kind of yeah. walks you through how to do it, which I was shocked that you used pictures of you in your bathroom. And like, yeah, I've got clothes on. but He's got his know, clothes on, yes. But honestly, I feel like the biggest hurdle for most people to do a coffee enema is the fact of just the unknown. Like, what, what, what's this doing? How do I make the solution up? Like, what happens in the bathroom? So I literally, yeah, I'm in the bathroom. Like, here's how I set it up. And obviously, I've got clothes on. But then when you see it, you're like, oh, that makes sense. And it 
it, it makes that first time so much more comfortable. Oh and then you do it a few yeah, times and it's so like, great that you actually put yourself out there to do that. I was like, <laughs> awesome. Like I'm like in the closet with my coffee and I'm just, not now. <laughs> and I've used them in the past when I'm doing a cleanser, like, because you feel so, if you do feel crummy, it's can be instant relief. Or I've used them when it's like the bowels aren't moving and it's like, I got to get things rolling and there's no better thing to do than having a coffee enema to get things rolling again. Yeah. And also when you're uh, water fasting, uh, it's awesome. When you are parasite cleansing, which you could also combine with water fasting as well, kind of the ultimate diet, if you will, parasite cleansing, you know, they're fantastic. So drainage, it, if you understand drainage is first, changes everything. Then the next step is parasite cleansing. Parasites are, if you will, kind of that mother cell that has to be taken down first before the other things will unlock. Mold spores will live inside of parasites. So if you're in a moldy environment and you remedy or you move and you're like, I still feel like I'm mold sick, it could be because mold spores are in parasites and you got a parasite cleanse to clear, clear those mold spores, release those out. Um, heavy metals, parasites are sponges for heavy metals. They absorb six, sometimes eight times their weight uh, body weight in heavy metals. So if you're like, hey, I'm all detoxed, did you parasite cleanse first? Then you're not all detox because toxins are in parasites. Parasites in the body are going to house those. Um, bacteria and viruses, you know, like I said, Lyme disease will live inside of, of parasites. Certain viruses will actually live inside of parasites. And parasites just completely mess the immune system up to allow vir viral replication out of control. So if somebody's been battling EBV, trying to heal their thyroid, and you haven't parasite cleansed, good luck on trying to get through that chronic infection until you clear parasites because parasites just mess up the TH1, TH2 immune system, create autoimmunity, and you clear parasites out, you take down so many things. So drainage, then parasites, then that allow you to clear mold and always make sure your environment's safe. Then you can start detoxing and really clearing out the heavy metals. And then one of the last steps is essentially the bacteria and virus, the chronic infection. So if you're like, hey, I have EBV or CMV or Lyme, and you- Those and other things have to come first. They have to come first. Because I get the question all the time, Dr. J, I've been diagnosed with, fill the blank in, what do I do? Follow this order. It's still the same order. Um, it's, just, it's just given a different name. Because what if I have Hashimoto's and I've been diagnosed with Lyme disease? Well, how do you know that nothing else is an issue? How do you know that you know, you're- your phase three drainage of your liver is not borderline clogged up and you're about to get a gallbladder out. How do you know that you don't have parasites all over your body when the testing is so inadequate? So um, if there's those other things, always got to go in order. And believe me, it changes lives. I mean, my wife, my wife is the best case study. Mm -hmm. Had thyroid. Now when we run labs and things like that and the way her health is, it's like her thyroid is completely normal. However, it was chaotic before, you know, and she was getting the thinning of the eyebrows and, um, you know, super lethargic, could barely get out of bed. I mean, had all those types of symptoms, but now look at her and it's like, you would have no idea that she went through what she went through, but it, 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 it took adversity. It, I mean, and that, but that's where we learned, you know, it took, mm -hmm. took some hard moments and challenges, but, um, you know, either we look at life as everything is happening to us or for or, us or everything is happening for us. And the moment that you shift and you realize this is for me, your outlook on life is completely different. Your excitement level is completely different. You might not feel great, that's okay. Like you're, you're in the trenches, like you're in the process. But if you get that it's not happening to you, like why, why me, God, why me, yeah. why this? Why? It's like, no, this is happening for you so that you get on things like this thyroid series to start learning what you need to do to create optimal health because maybe you learning then is going to teach, you're going to be able to teach your kids or grandkids, right? Those principles that you'll impact their lives and then who knows how many lives they'll impact. And it's so easy just to think about me. Like, well, this is so much work for, for me. me. Syndrome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's not about you. No. You know, it's not about you. And it's just a shift in perception. And I always tell people that it's like, you can either look at it as being the worst thing that's ever happened to you or the best thing that's ever happened to you. And it's hard to wrap your head around. How could this possibly be the best thing that's happened to me? But if you look back on all of the times in your life where you've had big shift, big change, big life aha, did they come from super happy moments? Mm, probably not. <laughs> no, During nobody years. grows on top of the mountain. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I always, this series wouldn't have happened and 
if I hadn't gone through my own stuff with thyroid where I was going, I need more information. I need a deeper look at what's happening with the thyroid, searching for this information, coming out on the other side of it and going, now this is why this has happened to me because now I need to bring it to other women. So this one, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the crap. And it was years and years and years and years of stuff for myself with chronic migraines every single day, like no way to be living. Um, but I can now look back going, okay, oh, thanks. I, knew, I see now why this has happened because there's how, it's, this is a growing epidemic of thyroid right now, of hypothyroidism, especially in women. It's insane and it's getting more and more and more. So thanks to people like Dr. J here, we are able to get to the bottom of it for some people. So just quickly, um, and I'll let you go here. Timeline wise. So we're supporting drainage, which I think obviously this has to happen on a daily basis. So that's the kind of thing you need to be implementing now, no matter who you are and keep up with it. The parasite stuff, what are we looking at? Are you saying like, should we be doing like a three month parasite protocol? So drainage, uh, minimum 30 days, typically. Okay. The more sensitive, the longer you've had health issues, the more quote unquote chronically ill you are. Maybe you want to extend that a little bit longer, but I would say 30 days is a good standpoint. The general population, 90 days of parasite cleansing being persistent, consistent is what I recommend. Most people probably watching this series, I would recommend honestly, probably six months of parasite cleansing. Um, most people have not parasite cleansed. And if they have, like I had done parasite cleanses before, and then when my friend, Dr. Todd Watts, gave me some Amosapudica seed, and 17 days later, I like go to wipe, and there's these worms hanging from me into the toilet bowl, which is disgusting, but I'm like, what? You know, I, I actually yelled at my I wife. I remember that, hearing that story. That yeah. was the first time I came across you was I heard you telling that story. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and as soon as I, and they were dead, but I pulled them out of me. I'm like, wait a minute. If I, a relatively healthy guy have these like foot long things hanging out of me and have them inside of me, who else does? And I implemented across the board with chronic Lyme cases, which I mean, almost, I shouldn't say all, but a lot of chronic Lyme cases have thyroid type issues. And I mean, one of the biggest improvements ever, if I a relatively healthy guy has them, you can say pretty much everybody else does. And, so and should my, everybody do it? Yes. Everybody should okay. parasite cleanse. Yep. Um, what so about, like, does it destroy your good bacteria? I always worry because people take these harsh, like oregano oil and like, I'm always trying to find things like to just mimosa pudica and the tutka. Are they hard on your good bacteria as well? No, no. Okay. Very gentle. Nope. Okay. Nope. Very oregano oil. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. pretty harsh. That'd be like, you know, well, maybe black wall, all of it is so hard on your gut. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, the Formula One and the Mimosa Pudica seed, I mean, you can take those 90 days straight easy where some of the straight up like wormwoods and oregano, you have to very short time periods and pulse because they're so stressful on the body. Yeah. So it really depends on what you're going to get. But also if, if finances are an issue, look at diatomaceous earth. I mean, yeah. it can be like pennies for a dose. You know, I have a bucket on my top of my fridge. I give it to my dog all the time. Yes. Yeah. Which I give you, to myself and my dog. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. You want to, if you have a uh, spouse, kids, I mean, you want to, whoever's the roughest health wise, start with them first, then go on to the family after a couple months and add them in because I've had clients where they, they're like, I just feel like I can't get over this infection and then find out the husband or the, the wife has passed it back, right? Like you, sh you share close quarters. Yeah. Uh, same thing with animals. Like, does your dog or cat sleep in your bed? Do you let them lick your mouth? Like you're going to, you share stuff. So um, it's good for the whole family to cleanse. Yeah. So six months, Paris, three to six months for everybody across the board and, and then start testing for the big stuff or do we test first? You, you, you can always run, you can always run labs and, and get a baseline and then recheck along the way. Uh, if you don't have access to run labs or finances are tight, you can just mm -hmm. start with drainage go after the parasite side. The parasite labs aren't great anyway, so it's not like you're gonna take a pre and post because most of the stuff will come up negative. I mean, I've had people where they literally, they, they poop a worm out and it's on top of the stool sample and it comes back negative. Like, okay, what, you know? Like, oh my gosh. Is it even okay. worth spending the hundreds of dollars for that, you know? 
Well, uh, our, and- I'll just quickly tell my story about that one, if you don't mind. I did um, a stool test with um, just my Life Labs here in Canada, which is the labs that everybody, all the doctors use. And it came back totally negative of anything. And I was like, oh, okay, great. And then I ended up at the same time, I thought, well, I'll go get one from my naturopath too and paid the big bucks to get a stool a comprehensive stool test done and it came back that I and I was riddled with blastocyst as hominess and the other one tested me for that at the same week and it came up totally negative so there yeah the, yeah there's a lot of critters that are going to impact the body and just understand if it's blasto if it's clost uh uh, Clostostridium or these other types of things that are in you, if there's one, there's going to be multiple. So, you know, if, if a lab comes back and shows one positive, like, oh, I've got Lyme, it's probably not just Lyme. If you come back just with, you know, H. pylori or Blasto, it's probably not just that. You really want to, um, it's too easy to be just tunnel vision and then you miss out on other things. And do you do the GI, like what do you, if you are going to test, what do you use? Uh, GI maps or do you use? I just like the regular comprehensive metabolic panel. Um, And then as far as, you know, parasite testing, I just don't like any of them because if it comes back negative, you're still going to cleanse. So why not just put those finances toward cleansing and then, and then look in your, look in your poop, you know, look in the toilet. I mean, that's, and only 30% of parasites you can actually see by the naked eye. So even if you don't see anything, doesn't mean it, but I mean, it's so much easier to see stuff in your stool than, hoping that a lab comes back. Mm-hmm. And so you have some amazing products that nobody else has. It seems like, like you actually sell the mimosa pudica, which I found was hard in Canada to find. Do you ship to Canada? Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah we ship yeah. around the world. Yeah. So my, my, fr- my good friend, Dr. Todd Watts, he gave me some mimosa pudica seed years ago. And when I sort of pooping worms out, I'm like, wow, this is a big epidemic. And then um, started just referring people like, get it from him. Cause he, he was the guy a little over five, probably five and a half years ago that brought it to the world, but he did it. He tested it for at least a few years in his clinic before he even kind of put it out there to the world, making sure that it does what it does and, and works and things. So he definitely deserves all the credit there. Um, and then we just became better friends over the years. And my brother-in-law was like, why don't you partner with Todd and come out with some better products on the market? And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. And Todd was standing right there. He's like, yeah, that's a good idea. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's happening. So that's kind of, how that happened where we formed microbe formulas and and kind of went on from there. But uh, it was funny in our friendship earlier on, I tried to talk him out of having a supplement company because I'm like, you still want to deal with the regulation, the, you know, the hassle and things like that. Luckily he didn't listen to me. So, um, (laughs) but yeah, I guess just so everybody knows where our our heart is, it it is just to bring out more effective things to the world and and help people get better. So yeah, you have some amazing kits online so that people can go in and and I'm going to link to it in the show notes. Um, And you do, are you still taking coaching clients as well? Uh, My team does. Um, Otherwise, yeah, not, not myself right now. just with all the, all the everything else going on. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Activities. But um, you know, I oversee all the cases with my team and and there's at home program as well that uh, a lot of people can just do it, you know, DIY at home. Uh, by themselves too. So awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was amazing. It was so much information that, uh, and if, if you want more, Dr. J's everywhere, you can find him on so many different podcasts. He's got lots of information on his site, lots of great articles. You just posted one last week on thyroid and, uh, parasites. So, um, you know, head over there. Some of this stuff is like went way over your head because we only have this short amount of time to get you guys this information. And I know a lot of it, you're going, I've never heard of these things before what the frick is drainage and coffee enemas and so he's got he he takes a deep dive into all these things on his site and you can find him on multiple podcasts like i said so go check him out but thank you so much for being here and taking the time to speak with us thank you